in fact, worked with Roger on the Department of Energy uh, in its initial launch. And so Roger Lopez is uh, a director of engineering at Phase 2. He was the principal architect for the Department of Energy. And uh, I can't say enough about him. He's pretty amazing. Uh, he has a very long-standing background uh, in the enterprise Drupal space. Uh, prior to even coming to uh, Phase 2, he was at Sony Music and was a part of their enterprise system. And uh, that is my introduction to Roger. All right, thanks. Take it away, Roger. Yeah. Um, and I'm talking, and Roger, I'll do some of the intro slides um, in terms of who's face too as well. <laughs> yeah, that's um, what I was going to say. We've got this couple of slides coming up. Uh, and just real basic, and you probably already know this, I'll talk for probably 30 seconds. Uh, phase 2 is uh, a 70-person company. Uh, we used to be the largest uh, Drupal company until there was a, a, a merger in Germany recently, uh, which I think they have 140 people. And uh, we specialize uh, probably not just in Drupal, but we do quite a bit of, of mobile and other open source uh, work. And in terms of our platform work, uh, you see some of our clients, which include the Department of Energy, the White House, FEMA, Essay Lauder, uh, Thomson Reuters, AP. So uh, we do have quite a bit, a bit of experience in this case. Next slide. And it's just, a, a, again, a little bit of our background. Uh, in terms of our involvement in the Drupal community, we have uh, over 55 uh, Drupal professionals, um, uh, 12 speakers at a Drupal Con Denver. And just even after Denver, we had uh, four speakers in uh, Drupal Con Unix. Uh, we maintain 50 plus modules and uh, maintain four uh, distributions. Thanks, Nicole. And can you hear me? This is Greg at Phase 2. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Sorry about that. We had some technical difficulties on our end. Um, yeah, just, just as a follow-up to what Nicole said, there are uh, a few what are called uh, products or distributions that we maintain at Phase 2. So Open Public, Open Publish, Open Atrium, these are our Drupal pages that we use for various, uh, various verticals that we serve. So the, the notion of a platform is important to us, especially when it comes to open public. So open public was used, for instance, for the, the recent DHS.gov launch, which was built on top of FEMA.gov and Ready.gov that had been deployed previously. Uh, open public was also used for Georgia.gov pretty recently. Um, so uh, that, that launched uh, just over the last few weeks, and that involved the transition from BitGet to Drupal. So if you if you look at Georgia.gov, that's all based on public, um, that distribution. So I uh, sorry for the technical difficulties, but I can pass it over to Roger now. And Roger, if you, you uh, walk us through the Energy.gov, that'd be great. Thanks, Greg. Nicole. Um, as Nicole mentioned, uh, my name is Roger Lopez, um, principal architect on uh, Energy.gov, and uh, I've given this presentation in a number of different forms, and uh, so this is a uh, fun. You speak to up, be Roger. Able to, let me see. Is that any better? Uh, no. No. I don't know if you can get your mic a little more. That's right on my face. Um, is this better? Because no. Greg was a lot louder. Huh. Okay. Um, let me see if I can. There's anything I do to switch this real quick. And while while Roger's doing that, Bruce, the format that we planned on was just to go through these slides, have Roger go through them for about 45 minutes, and then yeah. questions at the end or any preference for that. It's fine. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, I'll just do my best to speak as loud as I can. Um, That's better. Okay. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, so uh, last year around uh, the beginning of 2011, 
uh, we started meeting with the Department of Energy to discuss uh, building their beautiful new um, state-of-the-art government site. Um, so uh, in meeting with them, uh, some of the primary project goals, actually the one primary project goal uh, that we came up with that everything else revolved around was the consolidation of these hundreds of different office sites that they had. Um, these office sites comprised um, separate, separate physical websites for all of their program offices, for all of their divisions and sub-agencies, and, and uh, the Department of Energy uh, funds a lot of uh, labs and uh, different research projects. And all in all, they had um, something like 2,000 domains. Uh, something really ridiculous, and each of these had its own budget, and really um, there was nothing in common uh, from a technology standpoint between any of these. And so uh, our primary goal on this project was the consolidation of all of these sites. Uh, so that meant you know, technology, uh, hosting stack. Um, they wanted to present a unified design and a unified voice, which meant um, bringing all of the design and a lot of the content and cross-pollinating that content across all of these different sites. And uh, also they wanted to bring the maintenance into, uh, cons consolidate the maintenance of, of all of these um, to have a you know, huge, huge cost savings. <clears throat> so um, in going through all of these uh, different aspects of this one primary goal, um, we translated that into uh, some technology goals. So um, to go along with the maintenance, we wanted to make sure that we were choosing the right technology for the future um, so that we didn't put them on a platform that you know, six months down the road, they were needing major upgrades or you know, re-architecting in order to you know, uh, put any, uh, any additional uh, features into it. Uh, also, um, we wanted to transform a lot of the, the activities that used to be uh, technology exercises, that they used to have to find a sysadmin or a, an engineer or a developer to do. We wanted to take as many of those uh, activities and turn them into uh, content creation activities, um, especially the creation of, of all of these different office sites. Um, and lastly, we wanted to do everything we could to empower the content creators. Um, so uh, the, the first thing we came across, one of the very first decisions that we had to make was how are we going to future-proof uh, this technology stack? Um, this is a quote uh, that I heard Tim O'Reilly first say at um, presenting a, a keynote at a DrupalCon in uh, San Francisco, I believe. And uh, he made the point that an invention has to make sense in the world it finishes in, not in the world it started. And to, to apply this to our project, we had a, a long roadmap. Um, it was going to be about a year out from the first time we first started talking to the Department of Energy. So the decisions that we were making had to really apply um, a year from now. They had to be good decisions a year from now, not good decisions in the time that we were making them. So um, just a little timeline. Uh, so it was right about the beginning of the year that we were starting to do our discovery. Uh, Drupal 7 released in, uh, on January 5th of 2011. Uh, so it had just, just come out. Uh, the contributed modules um, have a historical, um, or have a history of lagging behind the, Drup the major Drupal core release. So a lot of the modules that we would typically rely on uh, were not going to be available right at that same time. Um, also, um, we, uh, we, were, we were getting ready to start development right away. Um, we were wrapping up discovery. We were um, trying to put the final details on you know, budget requirements and what, what the scope was, was going to be and how we were going to fit that all together. And uh, I did some looking back. The first commit that we made to the, the energy.gov repository was April 8th of 2011. So this was uh, almost immediately after uh, DrupalCon, um, where the big rallying cry was to start building Drupal 7 sites. But at this time, really nobody was doing it. And we still had projects that we were starting on Drupal 6 for one reason or another. 
So um, energy.gov eventually launched on August 3rd. So you can see that's well, it's eight full months after uh, Drupal 7 was released. And even at that time, it was the first, I, I can't say definitively the first, but it was one of the first large enterprise scale sites to launch on Drupal 7. Um, and then this last date is really the, the reason we, we made this decision is that uh, Drupal maintains um, security support and maintenance supports for its releases, uh, for, for two releases at a time. So the plan right now is for Drupal 8 to be released um, around August 2013, which would mean that Drupal 6 would, ha would reach end of life in August 2013. And so we definitely want to give uh, the Department of Energy more than two years runway um, with a platform that we're building. Um, so Drupal 7 uh, gave us a lot of new toys to play with um, that, that we didn't have in Drupal 6. And we really took the opportunity to uh, kind of retool our stack in moving to Drupal 7. Um, a lot of things that we relied on contributed modules for, uh, we, we, we took this opportunity to see if, if they were still needed or if Drupal 7 presented us the opportunity to kind of slim down all of the tools that, that uh, we, we came to rely on. And we found that uh, to a very large extent, things that we had always relied on uh, were no longer needed. So that lag of contributed module support for Drupal 7 was not as um, intense as, as we thought it was going to be. Uh, in addition, things like the UX improvements for administrators and the, the enhancements to the scalability and performance, uh, we realized we, there was just no comparison in Drupal 6. And to be able to, to make Drupal 6 do what we wanted, even with a very mature contributed uh, module was just not going to get us to the same place that Drupal 7 was. So um, ultimately, we made the, the choice to go with Drupal 7, and there was no looking back. So the contributed modules that we did use in this stack um, are, uh, by and large, rewritten completely for Drupal 7. And most of these modules did a really good job of tracking Drupal 7 from through, through the development cycles so that they were available very early on. Um, organic groups, which I'll talk about, um, got a huge rewrite. Uh, modules like context and media, um, well, not so much context, but media was targeted at Drupal 7. Uh, I don't think it even has a Drupal 6 release. And all of the field modules um, were once part of Drupal 6, or were once written for CCK and Drupal 6 but had to be rewritten completely for, for Drupal 7. So uh, most of our stack was you know, pretty much written directly for the platform that we were going to be building on. Um, in addition to that, we had some supporting technologies, uh, Apache Solar, to give us the, the best possible searching uh, search solution that we could find, um, Memcached uh, to help with our, our performance. Um, some, I just realized I don't have it in this. Uh, in the slide, but uh, uh, Varnish uh, for uh, reverse uh, proxy caching. And then we use Jenkins to do all the automation and tie the platform together. Um, so, so using the stack of technology, we felt we put the Department of Energy on a, on a very successful path forward um, without, having, without the need to constantly rethink um, all of their technology choices. Uh, in the near future. <clears throat> so the, the next major hurdle that we had to figure out was what to do about all of these office sites. So like I said, there were you know, 200 something of them um, that we were looking at. But in the uh, discovery phase, we had nailed it down to 13, uh, 13 offices that were going to be part of the original rollout. So. Um, we, we had to make sure that we were designing a site that would allow for this gradual rollout. <clears throat> so uh, in, in uh, architecting a solution for, for the offices, we want to make sure that, uh, like I said before, the, the maintenance and creation of these sites should not require any additional development or infrastructure. Um, 
we didn't want to get anybody outside of the, the core kind of uh, uh, web maintenance team involved other than maybe to like flip a DNS uh, entry or something like that. We wanted to keep it as, as central to the platform as possible. Uh, we also knew that we were going to have separate teams that maintained each of these sites. Uh, the, the same teams that that currently maintain the, the flat HTML or the cold fusion or whatever the other sites were, uh, we wanted to involve those teams as much as possible um, because ultimately they are the subject matter experts in their own content. And we wanted to take away any of the any of the web stuff that was not in their expertise and let them really shine by providing the best content possible. Um, and then we also wanted to take that content, which is ultimately the, you know, what we're presenting here on the website, and we wanted to spread it across as many of the offices as possible. Um, the, the labs have some really amazing content, and uh, there are, there are uh, initiatives like Energy Savers and, and different uh, offices that really have very, very good content that, that the public you know, could, uh, could make great use of. But that's not, that wasn't being shared, shared very well. And the reason is there was just no mechanism to do that. So uh, that, that became one of the core requirements. So uh, with these requirements in mind, this is where we turn to the organic groups module. Uh, organic groups is a module um, that's been around Drupal for quite a while. There's a, uh, a Drupal site called groups.drupal.org, which is kind of a, uh, a, a collaboration site for, for Drupal. Uh, there are groups there for uh, locales. So like there's a New York City group and there are groups around certain activities, but it's all about collaboration. And so the organic groups powers that site. And this is the, the first uh, use case for organic groups. But it's uh, since become a more useful and more kind of generic module that does just a few things, um, but it, it empowers you to do even more. So uh, with organic groups, you can, number one, you can create groups. Um, each of these groups has the ability to have content that belongs to that group and users that are members of that group. Once you have this structure set up, um, this allows you to do things like make a group be private to only its memberships or allow the content to be visible to the public but only created by its members. Um, and it also lets you kind of segment your site. So you, you have one Drupal installation, but uh, it, it can be shown as if it was uh, different portions of, of one big site or different topic sections, um, or I've seen it used where it looks completely different and it looks like it's many different sites. So that's kind of what we were going for here. Uh, yet we wanted to you know, maintain the same design. So um, it looked like organic groups was gonna satisfy all of our requirements. Um, or allow us to satisfy all of our requirements. So uh, we made the decision very early on that we're going to use organic groups. Um, just a, a note about the way that organic groups works is um, any fieldable entity in Drupal. So a fieldable entity is um, any type of object that can have fields added to it. Um, so uh, nodes, taxonomy terms, even users. Um, so any fieldable entity can now be a group or a member of a group. So uh, this gives us pretty wide ranging functionality in how we want to architect our solution, how we want it to put it together. So when I go in and I create a node, I have this option now. Do I want to make this a group or not a group? Um, also, if, if we go the other way and I'm creating a node and I want to select which group it belongs to, um, I have all of these uh, all of these options to me, and so as you can see, we've set up all the the offices as groups. So now, if I'm creating an, an article or a news story or something, I can very easily cross pollinate it against across whatever groups uh, I have access to. So, um, in actually getting to uh, actually going out and setting this up, 
and implementing it, uh, we decided that uh, what we were really doing with offices was categorizing our content into, into offices. There wasn't really any one entity that, that was an office. It was more along the lines that everything that all of the content and all the, the users that we are creating kind of were just being categorized by this. So uh, we made the decision to, uh, that, that a taxonomy term was the closest natural fit for what an office really was. So we used a taxonomy term um, and that, that taxonomy term uh, can then be either enabled or not as a group uh, using that little radio button that I showed you before. Uh, group enabled offices are the offices that are fully managed on the platform. So those are the ones that were in that original group of 13 offices and any of them that have come over since. But we also maintain a, uh, a term for the non-group offices. So these are the offices that still maintain their own site. The, there's an external site somewhere. Um, a lot of the labs right now are still external sites. Um, but we want to know about them on energy.gov. We want to be able to link to those and have a description. So, uh, so we, we still maintain that information so that we can, we can build the directory. So uh, this screenshot that I showed you before, uh, these are all uh, taxonomy terms on the site. Uh, some of them are groups, some of them are not, but we're able to, to build these lists and categorize them in all the same way, regardless of if we're managing them on the site or not. And then uh, when it comes time to actually migrate one of these sites that's, that's not part of the platform onto the platform, it's as simple as uh, going in and switching that radio button to, to turning it on to enable it as a group and then adding the content. So um, you know, everything we did here was really uh, intended to make migration of sites onto the platform as simple as possible. <coughs> so just a little bit about uh, office creation. Um, again, this is one of the things that we really wanted to focus on to make this as, as simple as possible. So uh, the steps for office creation are now you go in, you create a new office taxonomy term. You enable the, the group, um, you enable it to be a group. And then you go off and do all these uh, tasks. You create a home page note for it, you create a news page, you create a contact us page. Um, we realized that so much of this was repetitive that we went out and we created uh, a module to help us out with some of this. So uh, now the next step you get when you create one of these, these uh, office nodes is you get this uh, task list. Um, some of these tasks run automatically as soon as you create the, the taxonomy term for the office. Some of them are optional. So here we can see one where the contact us page um, and office specific vocabulary about us and navigation, et cetera, et cetera, have already been created, but we have a news page that is optional because not every, not every uh, office will actually have a news page. So th this was a way for us to, again, speed up the, the creation of these one-off sites um, while at the same time managing the, the complexity and managing uh, to keep it as uniform as possible. <clears throat> uh, this, this module that we built to do this, OG Tasks, is, um, was contributed back to the Drupal community uh, by, uh, <clears throat> by us and it's on drupal.org and I'll have a URL to that uh, at the end of the slideshow. Uh, so the, the next thing we wanted to talk about is empowering the content editors. Um, this is really kind of where we, we got to have you know, the, the most fun and there are really some challenges here uh, that were just kind of ingrained into the way that Drupal does things. So the major hurdles we had to, had to get over we're, we're really just some assumptions that Drupal makes um, about, about how your site's going to function. Um, so, so pages versus nodes and block creation versus block placement and revisions versus drafts are all about the way that we imagine somebody who's new to Drupal thinking about something 
versus the way that Drupal wants to train you to think about things. Um, and there's power on both sides of this equation. And we, we found ourselves kind of in a constant struggle of trying to figure out how far do we want to go to meet the our, our user base's current expectations versus how much do we you know want to rely on what Drupal does naturally and provide training and documentation. And so I feel that we did a pretty good job of meeting in the middle on most of these places. Um, so i uh, just take you through a couple of these. <clears throat> so this first one is uh, one, of the, one of the most core things that we did on the platform. It's the concept of pages versus nodes. So in Drupal, um, a node is the kind of most abstract form uh, of content. Um, a, a blog article can be a node. Um, pretty much anything that the user is entering into the system to create content is a node. The other thing about a node is it inherently has a, a URL that you can go to. So most of these end up as something like slash node slash one, two, three, but then they get you know nice URLs so that they don't look like that. But essentially every node that you create gets a URL. So there's this confusion of, am I creating a node? Am I creating a page? Um, and the thing about Drupal is it lets you decorate the page with whatever else you want. So you end up with a lot of pages where the node that you're creating controls the URL and it controls a block of text in the middle of the page, but it really controls nothing else. And this is something that we found over and over again to be very, um, very confusing for a lot of users and, and a major block into uh, managing a Drupal installation uh, efficiently. So um, there are other things that Drupal does that are very node-centric that exclude portions of the page that, that a user would think belongs to it. So those same blocks that you can decorate the page with um, don't normally get indexed for, for search uh, because they're outside of the node. Um, also, uh, things like workflow. If you, if you have a workflow system set up where you're, you're checking everything along the way, um, that only, occur, that only um, applies to the node itself, not anything else that's on the page. So again, just, just more confusion along the way. And it's not something that you, it's not something that's impossible to get past. We just wanted to find a way to smooth the, the transition um, it, into, into learning how to do this effectively. Um, so the, the way we wanted to really approach this was um, we figured this is mostly a kind of a, a, a page layout and a uh, kind of block placement uh, issue. So Drupal uh, has a way to you know, place content blocks all along the page. And so it's got this idea of, of a block. A block is similar to a node, except it doesn't have a URL and it's, it, it's not nearly as, as complicated and it, it can't do as much, but you can put content in it and you can put it on the page. So imagine like a, a, an ad or a promotion block or a block listing like the latest 10 comments or something like that. Um, so what we wanted to do is to be able to get those blocks and have them be managed as part of the node uh, so that it, it just kind of fits in with the mental model that most of our users have. So to do this, we used a module called block references. This allowed us to add fields to, to our nodes, to our content types that would allow us to specifically say exactly which blocks we wanted on, on the page. And so this brings our, our node and our page concept much closer together. Um, we built different landing page types of nodes um, and each one has, a, has, its own, um, has its own layout and its own regions where these blocks can be placed. Um, and by doing this, we were able to uh, kind of emulate what Drupal does naturally with regions, but at, at a level much closer to, to what the user's mental model is. Um, so here we see, uh, I believe this is the 
the home page. So we built a, a content type that would have this layout and this template. Um, and so each of these things that we see on the page are, are blocks. Uh, this is the home page. So the home page typically doesn't have any content that that belongs to that home page. Usually it's just an aggregation of other content that's on the page. So if I'm going to go create a home page, what I'm really saying is I want to put together a page that has this block here and this block here and this block here and this block here. So so that's what we did. Uh, likewise, on uh, this public services page, Again, this is just a, a landing page that aggregates content and, and exposes content from other parts of the site. But it's got different uh, different regions. And so each of these regions, we've got one across the top, three across the bottom. These are block reference fields. But we also mix this in with, um, with other field types. So we were able to add two text fields here so that these two, these two sections on the bottom could be you know, used for whatever needs to be. This is something that had always been very, very tricky to do in Drupal, um, and it always seemed like there was a better way. And uh, this is something that we were able to do uh, pretty successfully. So this is what the uh, administrative form for that uh, public services page looks like. You can see uh, here across the middle, we've got this upper blocks group, and it has two text fields, uh, left-hand, our upper left block group title and a right block group title, and then three sections for blocks beneath it. And so this is exactly how you uh, administer, administer this page. Um, the, the block uh, text fields are auto lookup, so you just start typing the name of the block that you want and it'll populate. Uh, you, once the blocks are in place, you can drag and drop them to change the, the order. Um, and so th this is something that we, uh, you know, we got a lot of uh, good feedback from um, in the administration of it. And ultimately, it lets our, our users build pages in the way that they think about pages. Um, oh, whoops. So um, uh, just one, one last uh, piece about this. So here we've got another page that block, 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 right? Um, but we've got this news and blog section on the on the left hand side. Um, so this news and blog menu block on the left side is actually placed using a module called context. And it's one of the more typical ways that you would place blocks uh, kind of site wide throughout a, throughout a site. So in, in this situation, we decided that, OK, anytime we have a news page, we want the left hand rail, we want the left hand sidebar to have the, the contextual menu of whatever it's on. Um, and we want that to always be there and, and not in the scope of, of the node and the block references. So this is uh, one way that, that we're able to kind of merge the old with the new, um, but it meant that we had to clearly lay out the expectations for what happened here. <laughs> so um, we've talked quite a bit about placement of blocks now and, and trying to trying to kind of crack that nut. Um, the next thing I want to talk about was block creation because um, block creation, like I said, blocks in Drupal are kind of the the dumb version of nodes. They, they they're very, very simple and they're very um, they're, there's not a lot that you can do to them. And most of the time they're completely generated from code. So it's great if you're outputting a list of dynamic content or something, but it's much more difficult to allow users to, to generate and users to create blocks. Um, and what we noticed with the designs that we got, and as uh, you know, as you probably noticed from the uh, the designs that I was showing you, blocks are everywhere on this site. Um, there are so many landing pages and so many places where we're trying to pull up content and expose it that uh, we we needed a way to to do all of this. So we had uh, basically two types of blocks that we wanted to create. Uh, one, we wanted to create some blocks that were like nodes. They had fields and they conformed to a, a certain template. Uh, and then we had all of these other uh, listing blocks, uh, which were just predefined list of, you know, I want node X, Y, and Z to appear in this list and I never want those to change. 
or I want like the the latest 10 news articles from the uh, Energy Savers blog. So we wanted to give users a way to do that. Um, again, power empower the users. Don't make them have to go to a developer for this type of uh, functionality. So here on uh, this page, you can see that we've got two uh, two blocks on the right hand side uh, that conform to the same template. Uh, they each have a, a learn more link, a large uh, image. Here we have um, three or two blocks. Uh, one is it's kind of hard to see here. Um, one has a, a listing of some news or a listing of blogs um, in one format, and the other column has a listing of news articles in another format. Um, so how do we how do we empower the user to do this. Uh, this is where we built a module called Beans, um, which are essentially block entities. Um, we've done everything we can to make blocks as powerful as nodes. Um, so uh, what, what the Bean module gives us is the ability to uh, create types of blocks. So in much the same way that we can create content types and types of nodes, we wanted to be able to create types of blocks. So we could say that we had a, you know, uh, promo image block or a news listing block. Uh, we wanted to be able to create these types of blocks. Um, all of the blocks had the ability to have fields added to them, uh, which makes them easy to to output according to a certain template. Um, and most importantly, the the data entry for these is almost identical to what users expect uh, from nodes. So here's all the block types that we have. Um, uh, these, this just shows the fields um, that are uh, the, the field administration for those blocks. Um, and here's an actual creation of one of the blocks. As you can see it looks and feels very much like the node form. So there's no, uh, you know, there's not yet another interface that our um, content contributors have to have to familiarize themselves with. Uh, here at the bottom of this, you see. Blocks also have the group audience fields um, tying back into uh, organic groups. This allows us to specifically target which group our blocks belong to, uh, making the, the filtering of blocks in the administrative interface much simpler. Um, just a, a slight tangent here. Um, one of the things that we found really powerful that Drupal 7 exposes to us um, is something called view modes. So view modes existed in a really simplistic fashion in Drupal 6 and were not really useful at all, but in Drupal 7 have become very powerful. Uh, so view modes are, I like to call, it, call them just named styles. So out of the box, uh, Drupal has uh, view modes for full content, teaser, and RSS. This is the way that we can take a <coughs> Excuse me. This is the way that we can take a blog post and have it look one way when you click on that blog post page, um, have it look another way when it's on the home page and just kind of like a river of news style, and yet have it have different content show up uh, when it's presented in the RSS feed. So uh, this just, like I said, gives us a way to name our styles and name the way that we want things to show up. So we use this a lot in the uh, in the blocks that we're and the beans and blocks that we are creating uh, to be able to take the same content and present it multiple ways, depending on the way that the user uh, decided to. Um, so here we see that we have two different, um, uh, this is the same type of content, but it's, it's shown in two different styles. So one, we have a related items, which would just be posted like on the side of a, a news story. But then we also have this block teaser, which exposes um, a an image. And the nice thing about these is the the image that's shown here doesn't have to be an image. It can be you know a video uh, thumbnail or whatever, um, depending on what type of content it is. All we're saying is whatever whatever content that happens to be, uh, uh, display it with the block teaser uh, view mode. So this was very helpful. Um, in building editorial listings, so uh, this is kind of the this was the the second type of of blocks that I was saying that we needed to build. 
Um, typically in building a site, we'll build out a lot of these listing blocks, but they're typically hard-coded. Uh, they may have some dynamic functions like figure out, you know, figure out what, what section of the site I'm in and show the latest pin post from that section of the site. So it, they'll be intelligent blocks, but what we really wanted is we wanted to be able to give our administrators the facility to create blocks according to whatever conditions they wanted. Um, if you look at the, uh, um, actually it might not still be there, but um, at one point on the homepage we had a, a listing block that was, you know, the top five articles from um, I think five or six different, five or six different groups. And so there was just hand selected groups and it was, you know, just exposing content that the, the site administrators thought was, uh, thought was the most relevant. And so by doing this, we're able to um, give them a very, very simple way to build these types of listing sites um, and, uh, and expose them. So uh, this, uh, again, just, just putting power into the hands of our, our content editors. Um, one of the, the next things we realized was that our, uh, mo not most, but a lot of the blocks that, that were on the comps had some sort of data visualization component to them. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you guys, you know, have ever seen this in, in your work, but anytime um, I've seen people put data visualizations or any kind of graph or chart or, or visual um, onto the website, it, it never matches what's on the, you know, what's already on the site. You know, it's, uh, they're usually one off created in Excel or, you know, whatever program you have available to you, but there, there's no way to really kind of put any tight controls around that since they're always you know built and exported as as just images so we really want to build a tool to again empower the the editors uh, to be able to create these things from their own data so we investigated and there are three JavaScript libraries that we really liked for this and we wanted to build a tool that worked with them all so um, we built this uh, tool in a three-step process um, we created a, a JSON format, a JavaScript object notation format, um, that could be used with any number of JavaScript libraries. And then we built adapters for each of the libraries that we wanted, and then built a Drupal module to kind of tie it all together and be able to um, administer these things from the interface. So, you know, just some examples of the types of, uh, the types of graphs and visualizations that we wanted to build. These are each different types of graphs from the three different libraries that we wanted to use. So uh, in Drupal, what does this look like? Um, again, we have another form that's very similar to uh, the block in the node form that we created. This is a data visualization entity. It's got a title, has um, description, and we have the ability to either directly upload one of these uh, JSON files that, that conforms to the format that we um, that we specified, um, and in a, I believe in a later version of this, I think we might have had like a actual like where you could just kind of copy and paste into it. But from there, you go through and you select what type of visualization do you want and which library do you want to use. Um, and in the chart options, we have uh, what color palette do you want to use so that a your site could define a predefined color palette. And so again, this puts uh, this brings everything into uniformity while at the same time really empowering the content creators. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of uh, content creation is this idea of revisions versus drafts. Um, this is one of the kind of most frustrating things in Drupal um, is that it, it presents you with this idea of content revisioning. And so you, you kind of think that you're getting this really powerful um, revisioning system when really all, the, all you have at at your fingertips is the ability to see past uh, uh, content that you've created in the past. So you can, there's a checkbox, you click, yes, I want a revision of this content, but every, every change that you make still goes, still becomes published immediately. Um, and so th this is where kind of the, uh, this is where the opposition to the, the drafts idea comes in. 
what most of our users want is a way to create a draft of a, a piece of existing content without having it go live immediately. And even beyond that, what most of our uh, clients want is a you know, pretty standard workflow where you can create something in a draft state. Um, it can be flagged as needing reviewed. Um, whatever your, your review process is, you know, th this is not uh, something that's, that's uh, non-standard or this is not something that's, that should be a big ask of uh, a content management system. So uh, we set out looking for a workflow tool. Um, some of the other requirements that we put together is um, having, every, having all of our stuff, all of our uh, project being built um, and exported into code or being written directly from code. We want something that, that worked in that uh, development workflow. Um, and the number one thing is we need to be able to have multiple concurrent revisions so that we could have um, a, a published revision while other draft revisions were being created. Um, so, remember again, this is at the time where Drupal 7 has just been released. There's not um, a lot available in terms of uh, contributed module support. So, we did look at what was available. Uh, the workflow module was Drupal 6 only, and I believe to this day might still be Drupal 6 only. Um, there's a rules module, which is a very abstract way of putting together a uh, workflow system, um, and it just seemed like it was going to be kind of a house of cards putting together a workflow system that way. And then there was this new module coming out called Workbench Moderation, and it was brand new and uh, just didn't feel mature enough for, for what we wanted. Um, and if we were gonna use something that immature, we would rather build something directly to, to our specs. So we, st we set out to build our, um, a Drupal workflow engine, and we came up with uh, something that we call Stateflow. Um, basically, it does everything we want, uh, with revisions. So anytime you create a new node, it starts as a draft. Um, any published revision is never editable. Uh, you still get the little edit tab, but when you click that edit tab, uh, under the covers, it creates a new draft for you. So you never have to worry about anybody editing a published node outside of whatever your, your standard workflow is. Um, and anytime you publish, uh, a draft revision, it takes a current revision and then archives that for historical purposes and if you needed to, um, if we needed to uh, revert that. So, um, got a couple things in here. Um, just to, in, uh, to get going through this, uh, there's a uh, Drupal initiative uh, called Large Scale Drupal that's being led by, uh, kind of being orchestrated by Acquia. But the, uh, the concepts that we pioneered in Stateflow eventually became what is known as a content staging initiative. Um, this has uh, been led by developers at phase two. Um, and this is a really, really powerful mechanism for doing a full site preview um, with multiple unpublished revisions um, and then being able to bulk publish your, all of your content at once. So the very last thing I have is uh, iterating. We wanted to set up our, uh, we wanted to set up the uh, uh, Department of Energy to be able to iterate and com and continue to add functionality to the site. So uh, just a couple of notes on things that have been added post launch. Um, we've got usage reports for beans, uh, this concept of node bundles, and um, a number of uh, things that have been added to the. Uh, administration to uh, make that better. Um, so I've just got a couple slides in here with uh, URLs, but uh, I want to make sure that we get at least a few minutes for questions. Sorry, I uh, kind of went a bit long. Well, wow, this, that was wonderful, Roger. Uh, uh, I, I think we all learned uh, a lot of new tricks and, and uh, uh, salute the good work that went into that site. Um, Let's uh, open it up now uh, for uh, any questions that people have. Uh, this is Manil from UAH. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but uh, first, uh, what migration tool were used to move from, let's say, your development into going into production? 
Um, so we uh, uh, we we use Git for all of our for all of our code, and uh, we had uh, some jobs that we set up in Jenkins to automate the deployment of code. Um, but as far as uh, as data and content, uh, we made sure that all of the all of the content resides first on the production environment, and so we we make it a, a you know a point of policy never to uh, push development data into production. Is that what you were talking about in terms of migration yeah, into yeah. production? So yeah. the content for, let's say, for uh, bug fixing or things like that, you push the content from production to development? Yes. Yeah, we, we one, of, one of the jobs that we have in Jenkins uh, will do a, a sync of the database from production down to any of our lower environments. Um, and it also gives us a way to get a, a quick database dump in case we need it to do something in another environment. Okay. Uh, I have a, a, another question. So you, you said the the, uh, the data viz and the state flow are are those modules in Drupal now or? Yeah, no? they are. They are. Here we go. So yeah. We, so um, I I all uh I can distribute my slides. But the URLs for all of those are in here. Um, we've got Bean and OG Task and DataViz and State Machine and the Content Staging Initiative. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? So you built in this facility for. Uh, Sites that are, are not on board yet to come on board. Uh, has has the the site that you built uh, created uh, enough uh, excitement for people who you know had their own shops and their own you know back ends to uh, to want to move over? Yeah, that's um, that was one of the biggest challenges we met when doing the first set of uh, kind of pilot offices to move on to the site. Is the uh, the people we were working with at the Department of Energy chose a number of sites that they felt were kind of small enough in scope and would be kind of easy wins, and then they also intentionally chose some that they knew were going to be challenging, either from from the standpoint of not wanting to move or the standpoint of of having a challenging site uh, to migrate. Um, it kind of helps that there's this huge cost cutting initiative going on, so. Um, the uh, you know the, the um, there's almost a not a demand but there's a you know there's a you know policy in place that eventually they will all be moved over um, so but we did have to to build in enough stuff to to get the excitement level up so that you know people weren't rebelling um, we did see a number of offices that were not rebellious but hesitant at first uh, but I think. At this point, you know we've got pretty full buy-in um, from from all of the offices that are on the platform, and we're starting to see uh, more offices uh, kind of wanting to come onto the platform. And this is uh, this is Frederick with Phase Two as well. Um, yeah, one of part part of along that line that recently um, a big initiative that just came through was the Energy Savers Initiative. So. Um, that was uh, our, our recent development in the last couple of months are uh, really focused in on um, getting a lot of the consumer facing initiatives to save energy uh, within the platform and it immediately almost doubled the energy dark uh, traffic and that effort one of the things that we've done to I don't want to say market but in terms of um, convince and, 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 and show the platform is flexible enough is to actually build tools for um, the different needs as the offices come into the platform. So um, there was an earlier question about content and how it gets into production. You know, one of the features that we that we recently built was this idea of privacy before things are are actually shown to the public. So um, an office that's coming in, if they have a lot of content that they're either reviewing. Um, or they want to call or just kind of review before it goes into production, they can actually go through the full workflow process and have that and have that uh, content behind the scenes 
um, and then basically just flip the switch and everything just kind of exposes itself. That was specific to the Energy Savers uh, migration because they had, you know, thousands of articles, different types of things they want to show, projects, um, you know, contacts for certain ideas, but they wanted to essentially have a, an internal launch first so, so that the different uh, teams could see it with the appropriate permissions. And then once it was ready, all they had to do was flip a switch um, within the platform um, and the content was, you know, pulled into solar, the public could see it, and it was a very smooth migration. So those type of features, you know, are enticing um, to offices bringing their content over. Um, and I think the other thing that, you know, I think that uh, the offices are starting to realize too is that they're not in a silo anymore. When an office, you know, has a particular feature that they want, because they're on the same platform, that other office can now share in that, you know, content feature, that particular feature too. So if one office wants, you know, specific calendaring function, that's a platform specific thing. So now all offices can, you know, add calendars, add event uh, specific or block types, et cetera, instead of it just being, um, you know, one office that, that gets all the goodies. So.